After more than a year of bruising, sometimes deadly confrontations, leaders of Russia's political factions signed a peace pact last week, pledging no more violence before the 1996 elections. But can they keep their word? Within America, Clinton fired on the Congress. Would you agree to that? No? When you have elections, do they fire on the White House? Tonight on Frontline, Russia. How radical economic reforms have led to social turmoil and violence, crippling the presidency of Boris Yeltsin. If you have a drop of honor or dignity left, resign along with your bankrupt government. It seems to me that today, when Yeltsin walks up to the mirror, he doesn't see himself. He sees Gorbachev there. Because today he is repeating Gorbachev completely. Tonight, the struggle for Russia. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. in fear and then in wonder during those terrifying days in August 1991. The attempted overthrow of Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev was defeated less than three days after it had begun. And Boris Yeltsin, the recently elected president of Russia, became the symbol of his country's break with the past. The junta will not succeed for democracy. In three days, we made the march of a decade, said a Russian who was there. We were in the clutches of an irrational idealism, said another. We had won, and we believed we would wake the next day in the kingdom of freedom and democracy. Two and a half years later, the idealism of that August seemed a distant and melancholy memory. Russia faced yet another time of troubles. Her people deeply wounded, divided, afraid. In parliamentary elections, nationalists and communists had won a majority. And the world was once again hostage to the Russian drama. In a country one of its own poets describes today as a proud beggar with an atomic bomb. In this new Russia, women line outside subway stations trying to sell whatever they have. Some see them as part of a painful but necessary process of change. Others see tragedy. Grandfather died 40 days ago yesterday. I must pay back the neighbors I borrowed money from. It's very difficult to bury people nowadays. A grave costs 6,000 rubles. A coffin is 6,000. I sell whatever I come across. Today I sold milk. I bought it for 90 rubles, sold it for 100, and made 10. Sometimes I earn a hundred rubles a day for bread. Now I don't understand what's going on in this country. Do you know? We ourselves just don't know. No one knows what will happen next. God grant that in five years, as they say, everything will be fine. Who says this? The people. The people say this? What people? It's just an empty phrase. God knows what they'll promise us next. In Russia today, they repeat questions they have been asking themselves for centuries. What they call the cursed questions. 
Who can be happy here? What is to be done? Who is to blame? The story of how the Soviet Union, one of history's most powerful empires, suddenly vanished, is bound up, as is much of Russia's stormy past, in palace plots, court intrigues, and fierce struggles over change. It is the story, in part, of a personal feud. A feud between Mikhail Gorbachev, the communist reformer who forever changed Soviet society, and the man he chose as one of his allies in taking on the totalitarian regime. When Gorbachev summoned Boris Yeltsin to run the city of Moscow, he was selecting a man with a background much like his own. Both had been born in 1931 to peasant families. Both would mature in the hidden world of the party elite, where loyalty was expected and rivalries were fierce. The personal battle between Gorbachev and Yeltsin didn't result in anything positive. I was always against it. I told this to both of them. But it has its historical roots. Both were part of the leadership core of the party. They have been different, but very strong. In Moscow, Yeltsin would continue the maverick style that had been his trademark as a communist boss in the Urals. Gorbachev astounded the world, a Soviet leader who could walk out with bright eyes and a big smile. But it was actually Yeltsin who invented it. I remember I was a student at the time. There was a group of people. I walked up and at one point was pushed against this huge back of a man. I couldn't figure out who it was. I looked up to discover the head of Yeltsin was at the top of this huge male back. This was during the time Yeltsin walked around the streets and inspected stores. We don't need milk so much in the summer because it goes sour quickly. He's a typical Russian man. When I look at Yeltsin, at his manner, at his gestures, at his character, I remember my father. My father was the same kind, cool, stocky, sharp and slow-moving, all at the same time. This is a type of Russian man that's very familiar to me, like my own relatives. Well, we do need more milk and cheese. Yes, but if you buy a lot of milk and cheese and eat them all, the doctor tells you to eat less. He invented public opinion. He discovered that it does, in fact, have some meaning. The traditions of the party leadership were not just to ignore public opinion, but to disdain it. Look at all the bones. This one piece of meat has so many bones. Yeltsin was like Robin Hood. He was the Avenger who would appear all over the place, showing up at unexpected times. Gorbachev couldn't help but notice this. He couldn't help but be astounded and furious because it was a violation of his monopoly. We had one leader in the country, and the people should love that one person. Maybe it wasn't Stalinist times anymore, but the tradition remained. And suddenly, before his eyes, a competitor appears. As head of the Moscow party, Yeltsin constantly clashed with local party chiefs who were living off goods intended for the city's stores. His relations with the communist hardliners surrounding Gorbachev began to sour. And then in 1987, Frustrated at Gorbachev's lack of progress in making the changes he had promised, Yeltsin would cross an invisible but very real line. In a secret meeting of the party central committee, he would attack Gorbachev for refusing to listen to criticism. 
and accuse him of erecting a Stalin-like cult of personality around himself. Three weeks later, Gorbachev would order his protege out of his hospital sickbed and force him to endure four hours of denunciations before expelling him from his post. And at that moment, Gorbachev uttered the one phrase that until today has determined their relationship. He said to Yeltsin, I will never let you back into politics again. And then he made this absolutely unbelievable mistake. He left Yeltsin in Moscow. I think well of Gorbachev. It did not occur to Gorbachev, Yeltsin would later say, that he had created a set of democratic processes and his word as general secretary had ceased to be that of a dictator. It would be only 16 months before Yeltsin would re-emerge a democratic hero. By 1990, he would be elected on the third ballot and then by just five votes more than he needed, head of the parliament of the Russian Republic. It was a victory Soviet President Gorbachev had done all in his power to prevent. What do you think of Gorbachev's defeat? I think it will create difficulties for him. But he should reflect on how to build bridges in the name of preserving the Union. I'm ready to do my part. Now the ball is in his court. Are you doomed to come to terms with Gorbachev? I'm not sure who's the one who is doomed. Both of them are rather vivid leaders who were both struggling to be in power. And they constantly watched each other, like jealous women, watching each other at every step. You would think, these are people who are controlling the fate of the state. And they should be ruled by something great inside of them. But in reality, politics in Russia is just intrigue. On July 10, 1991, Boris Yeltsin is inaugurated the first democratically elected president in 1,000 years of Russian history. Moscow would now be the seat of two governments, the Russian Republic headed by Yeltsin and the Kremlin regime of Gorbachev. But only Yeltsin had been elected by popular vote, and Gorbachev would be forced to deal with his rival's legitimate claim to power. The two presidents will agree to a blueprint for a new Soviet Union, a treaty that will move major power to the republics and limit the Kremlin's ability to dictate the life of the country. It is to be signed the day after Gorbachev returns to Moscow from his summer vacation. Monday, August 19, 1991, the day before the new Union Treaty is to be formally adopted. The people of Moscow awake to a nightmare. It is a coup launched against Gorbachev by hardline communists in his own government. A move to save their kind of Soviet Union and their own power within it. Over the radio, Yeltsin implores soldiers not to fire on their own people. By noon, he publicly condemns the coup from atop a tank that has come over to his side. Be careful, Boris Nikolaevich. Take care of yourself. We do not doubt that the international community will objectively judge what is happening as a cynical right-wing coup attempt. It will be one of history's enduring images. Yeltsin's government in the Russian White House becomes the rallying point for the resistance. As ordinary people build barricades outside, inside, 
Yeltsin and his aides try to frighten the coup's leaders with the threat of bloodshed. The unarmed people are their shield. The flip side of democracy is responsibility. We're obligated, obligated to defend the government. Fascism won't succeed. Fascism won't succeed. The first shots come just before midnight on the second day. You bastard, what have you done? You killed someone, you pig. Bastard, bastard. The dying regime will claim three lives. Three young men killed when they clash with a tank heading toward the barricades. But within hours, it is over. In the face of a defiance no one had expected, the attempted coup will evaporate. Today, we have adopted a resolution to declare the three-colored flag our official Russian flag. Boris Yeltsin had become the champion of Russia's democracy. The Russian flag had become its banner of victory. The Soviet president had been saved from a revolt organized by people he himself had refused to fire. He did two unforgivable, idiotic things. I can't forgive him, even though he and I have a good, friendly relationship. The first, he got off the plane and said he controlled the situation fully, which was just nonsense. And nonsense number two was that he didn't go to the White House and bow down to the people who had stood there for days defending him. He went home. At a press conference the next day, he will seem to apologize for the Communist Party, rather than blame it. He acted as if nothing had happened in those three days, as if there hadn't been tanks and troops in Moscow, as if no one had been killed, as if there hadn't been rallies, as if there hadn't been a fear that a tragedy would befall Russia. What was that all about? Was it because he was at a loss? It's hard for me to understand. There are various branches of the socialist movement because the socialist movement is not some kind of uh, one model uh, that, that, that is, or, or one model of the shoes. As in Italy, for example, shoes are made very well, but uh, it's not something for all countries. It's an idea, it's just an idea. Of course he was emotionally shocked. He was probably disappointed in some people he had trusted. But he didn't understand an entire epoch had ended. And because he didn't understand, he lost his political face. It would have been difficult for him to stay in power under any conditions. But what he said in the first minutes after he came back to Moscow showed he did not understand what country he had returned to. Boris Nikolaevich and I have met. Now he is giving me a short summary of the session of the Cabinet of Ministers, but I haven't read it yet. Read it out for everyone. <laughs> Mikhail Sergeyevich, read the document. Read it. It wasn't that he didn't understand. He underestimated Yeltsin by overestimating his own capabilities. And that prevented him from seeing the danger in Yeltsin. It kept him from seeing the consequences of what he himself had begun with his reforms. That was his overall weakness. He underestimated the consequences of what he had begun.
Comrades, let's take a break and sign a decree suspending the activities of the Russian Communist Party. The Communist Party was all but dead. The Soviet Union it had imposed collapsing. What remained in question was how far the Union's 15 republics would scatter and what role the Kremlin center, Gorbachev, would play among them. We are all very dependent on each other. We are greatly corporatized. We cannot destroy that under the pretext of the need for sovereignty. That's not what sovereignty demands. Realistically, he couldn't control anything. And now I suspect he understood very little of what was happening. He didn't understand that the republics really wanted independence. He didn't see that the economic system he supported had reached a complete dead end. Behind the scenes, Gennady Berbalis is a leading voice arguing that the republics are using Russia for its resources. Russia should defend itself, he believes, and go it alone. Can you explain the new slogan, a democratic and independent Russia? Do you mean that Russia will break away from the Union? No, it's something entirely different. Because Russia is now seen as an appendage of the center. We want Russia to be a truly independent republic within the USSR. At first, Yeltsin only saw the advancement of Russia as the major player within a confederation or some other form of commonwealth. But when they presented him with a plan to convince him that Russia could exist as an independent state, apparently that swayed him. Yeltsin will negotiate with Gorbachev and the presidents of the other republics at a time of great confusion. For all the talk of independence and sovereignty, there is also a feeling that they are bound by common interests that cannot simply be declared out of existence. Today we will discuss the ratification of the Union Treaty. Gorbachev would surrender more and more power to the republics in what is to become a union of sovereign states. We need to agree on this today because we must get somewhere. We all suspected there was a double game going on, but it was hard to do anything about it because the real power was moving bit by bit from the Kremlin to the White House. The fact is, he was carrying on parallel negotiations with Gorbachev on preserving the Union, while he clearly knew that people in his entourage were working on a program for independent Russia. Yeltsin also consults economist Grigory Yavlinsky, but he argues that splitting the Union's interwoven economies will lead to chaos. What was worrisome and upsetting was the ease with which the decision to do all this came together. The lack of any deep understanding of the questions. The lack of deep analysis, and one always worried about what would happen next to Russia. Because she might find herself in the same situation. Never in the history of humankind has an empire of this size not fallen apart. And that breakup has its own rules. Nobody can ignore them or try to change them. Bobulus was a person who determined the course, a person whose opinions Yeltsin took into account. Yeltsin at the time was the nominal head of the Coordinating Consultative Council, but it was actually Burbulus who ran it. And 
One member of that council was Gaidar. And later, when Gaidar entered the government, people were asking, how did Gaidar come to the government? No one knew him. Yegor Gaidar was a 35-year-old economist, the former economics editor of the Communist Party newspaper Pravda. Like many in the fledgling Russian leadership, he had been inside the White House during the attempted coup, helping defend it. Now he will agree with Bourbalis and draw up the economic endorsement for Russia to go it alone. It wasn't a professional economic decision, it was a political decision. But it was dictated by the severe and fatal nature of our economy, and by our understanding that any other political decision would lead to economic cataclysms. Burbulis pulled together the Gaidar team and they worked at his initiative. The idea of breaking Russia off is mostly connected with Burbulis. From the economic point of view, it was Gaidar's team. There was no craftiness, and we're not ashamed. We never saw ourselves as desperate revolutionaries who were trying to break things apart at any cost. It's hard to accuse them of a double game, because politicians are always carrying on double and triple wars, holding back decisions to the last minute. But I think one can have moral complaints against Yeltsin. It was possible to beat Gorbachev only in one way, to eliminate the country. The Soviet Union disappears. Gorbachev disappears. Yakovlev disappears. Shevardnadze disappears. The whole layer who headed the leadership of the country after perestroika disappears. On December 1st, the huge Republic of Ukraine will overwhelmingly vote to declare itself independent of the Soviet Union. Less than a week later, there will be a hastily called meeting of the presidents of the three Slavic republics in Belarusia. There was the leader, Yeltsin. There was the second hero, Kravchuk, the president of Ukraine. And then there was this other guy, Shushkevich, and his main job was to give them a table and tea. There are many legends about this. I think, of course, vodka. How could you get along without vodka? In any case, it doesn't matter what condition the three of them were in. They were trying to get rid of Gorbachev. No one knew what would come out of that meeting. No one knew how it would end. They got rid of the center and Gorbachev, and I think that was all they dreamed of. Meeting in a government house in the Belovershki woods outside Minsk. The three leaders will declare the Soviet Union dead. If people could ever see how it happened, they would never forgive those people. You could forgive them for the sake of a big idea, but there weren't any ideas there. And for the details, I simply do not feel like talking about them. It was a collective product, a collective work. I insist on this. That's the way I perceive it. December 8th, 1991. The citizens of the Soviet Union are told, the country in which you live no longer exists. With the stroke of a pen, brothers had become foreigners, and the empire, Russian greatness, had vanished. There is a legend that when the railroad was built between Moscow and St. Petersburg 150 years ago, 
Tsar Nicholas I was given a map of Russia. He looked at Moscow and Petersburg and laid down his finger and drew a straight line. That line went through villages, through rivers, but Nicholas didn't care. He drew the line with his fingernail and ordered it built like that. And thousands of lives were moved aside. That railroad was built on bones, on human blood, 150 years ago. And it is happening again now. The end of the existence of the Soviet Union was done in that way. It is the fingernail of Nicholas I. At 7.35 p.m. December 25th, the huge hammer and sickle was lowered for the last time. The codes controlling 27,000 nuclear weapons were passed from Mikhail Gorbachev to officials of the Russian Federation. The Kremlin was occupied by an elected president for the first time in history. And the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, born of the 1917 revolution, disappeared. The Cold War was over. The West, who had held on to Gorbachev for too long, changed its man and cheered. But the dangers of disintegration should have been clear. In the new Commonwealth of Independent States, nothing had been resolved, neither borders nor economic links, not control of the armed forces or ownership of nuclear weapons. There was no agreement over the fate of 25 million Russians living in former republics, no provision for the two million non-Russian refugees who would flee civil wars on the edges of the former empire. The scariest thing now is life, that even the children could die. The whole world knows, I think, about the bombing, the stealing and the killing there. We haven't seen my child for six months. He went to stay with my mother, but we couldn't get him out. It was too difficult. We are from Baku. We escaped because my husband was beaten up there. I gave voice and piano lessons. I graduated with two degrees and stayed there to teach. I was an army officer, a Russian officer, a commander of a unit, and now I'm on the street. I live in train stations and on the street. Everyone wants to spit on me. Am I some kind of a criminal? I don't know who's to blame. I think Gorbachev and his gang. It's very hard for an old person. With the Union gone, the real struggle for Russia will begin. It will be a struggle to nurture a fragile democracy and at the same time create a Western-style economy out of the wreckage of a planned one. Russian reformers will embrace radical reforms that had first been devised by American academics working to transform economies in Latin America and Poland. It is called shock therapy and it will quickly produce a world that Russians like 83-year-old Nila Rost have never seen before. How much are these? Everything is here. You can buy anything. Bacon, meat, rabbit, apples, whatever you want. They're just expensive. Bacon was last year four rubles a kilogram. Four rubles. Now 1,200. Think about that. Посчитать. 
пенсионеры не имеют. Пенсионеры не имеют так много денег. Только смотреть могу. Мы можем только смотреть, это все. Yeltsin had to demonstrate that Gorbachev had not moved forward with reforms for a long time, that the country was suffering from it, that the country was tired of living in expectation of changes, that changes should begin. So when Gaidar came to power, if he had come with different ideas, not shock therapy but something else, Yeltsin would have agreed to that. As an economist, Gaidar suspected there would be many difficulties. But as an academic, he didn't want to miss the chance to give it a try. He was like an experimenter, like Lenin, who said, we'll start the fight and see what happens. Like Lenin, Yeltsin's reformers had come to power suddenly. It was a moment when the Soviet Union was virtually broke and the empty shelf Soviet economy was collapsing. Old lady, they won't let us in. Why are you pushing? What are you doing? What am I supposed to do? I'm in the same position as everyone else. What does Gorbachev have to do with it? Yeltsin is your president, isn't he? He's responsible for all this. Great. And they're filming us, too. The reformers would adopt a strategy aimed at putting food in the stores. Prices would be instantly deregulated. The invisible hand of the market would determine the value of things. The strategy was also to eliminate the power of the old regime. I told the president the situation was not hopeless, as many people claimed. I told him we could begin reform. We could solve a whole range of fundamental problems considered the most insurmountable at the time. I told him that we could completely fill the shelves, overcome shortages, open the economy, begin privatization, and make the ruble convertible. I told him that this path exists, it is achievable, and it's the only way. It was promised there would be a sharp period of pain followed by free market prosperity. Promises he heard not only from his own advisors, but from the West as well. If he stuck to their definition of reform, Western businesses and banks pledged investment. Western governments pledged tens of billions of dollars in aid to soothe the pain of the shock. 24 billion in 1992 alone. Your newspapers made a huge deal about it. Your experts came in and said, yes, this is the only way to do it. This is absolutely the only way. He wanted people to like him. He wanted to be a hero. It's an enormous job to lead such reforms in Russia. Russians were allowed to openly engage in commerce, and they would pursue different paths. What's new? Speculators, people, young people. What do they do? They buy things from the government really cheap and then sell them on the market more expensive, and it's called speculators. It's not honest. They don't make it themselves, they buy it and then they sell it more expensively. It's not good. On the bottom rung of the emerging Russian capitalism, there would be an explosion of traders, like these cousins from Ukraine. They are called shuttles, shuttling by plane or train to foreign countries or former republics, buying low and hoping to sell high. But their goods aren't the bacon coveted by pensioners. The cargo stuffed in this first-class compartment on a Kiev-Moscow overnight train is 120 cases of Terminator bubblegum, featuring souvenir trading cards of Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
Double profit. Just from one trip you can make a year's salary. Otherwise you can't survive now. In Brezhnev's time it was easier to live. You could even buy caviar. I remember in 1990, a can of black caviar cost 13 rubles. Now it's 2,000. More than an honest month's work. At the beginning of May, I'm going to Holland. We need a big car, a Mercedes or a Ford Transit, a minivan, because there are many of us, and we have to transport the merchandise. I could buy a Jigoli tomorrow, but it's a small car. It's a Soviet car, not very reliable. It's better to buy a diesel car. Best of all, the Mercedes. Or a Ford Taurus. Oh, it's such a great car. What about a Copley? It's a more modern car, but a Ford Taurus. Oh, it's an American car, right? I'm crazy about this car. Oh, Lincoln, it's also a very good car. They're so long. And Jaguars. Oh, yes, Jaguars. I'm crazy about cars. Every day, the shuttles converge by the thousands here, once one of the world's largest sports stadiums. And in the days of Glasnost, the place crowds gathered to listen to democratic leaders like Boris Yeltsin. They sell Snickers, Mars bars, food, liquor, chewing gum, also leather goods, clothing, just about everything. They call it entrepreneurship, but this is just your basic speculation. It's unprofitable to produce anything. It's very profitable to resell. I didn't know they had stores for dollars here. There used to be a cafeteria, but when I went in and looked, there it was for dollars. Who buys? Those people who have dollars, they're the ones that buy. Marks or dollars or whatever you have. Would you like to buy a Mercedes-Benz? Mercedes-Benz? Yes. <laughs> Why? <laughs> to drive it. <laughs> life in the new Russia will increasingly become a life of paradox. Well, big one all wrong, done gone, make me understand the evidence for telling me tale. Too much monkey business, too much monkey business, oh, too much monkey business for me to be well, blonde hair, good looking, try to get me who she wants me to marry, settle down, I can't run around the booth. Too much monkey business, too much monkey business, oh, too much monkey business for me. In the hard currency stores and street kiosks, everything is available, but at prices few people can afford. Too much monkey business, too much monkey business, oh, too much monkey business for me to be traveling. Well, settle to get to me, run around the There is American television, American fast food, what are claimed to be American cigarettes, much of it advertised in a language most Russians cannot read. Too much monkey business, too much monkey business, too much monkey business, oh, too much monkey business for me to be proud. To outsiders, it may look like a nation gratefully embracing Western civilization, but the radical changes will inflame another eternal Russian question, to join the West or reject it. I know the United States very well. I studied the history of the country. I have a lot of friends there. Sometimes they don't understand what's going on here. Many of them thought there would be these wonderful young democratic people here coming to power who speak foreign languages and know how governments are organized in the West, who know what the market is. And after a year or two, you're going to be able to go from Chicago to St. Petersburg without noticing the difference. There would be the same stores, same signs, the same kind of life. It is an absolute illusion. Yeltsin had agreed to a scheme to try to shock the Russian economy into sudden new behavior. But prices had been freed while state monopolies were still in control. Boris Nikolaevich, look at the price of butter. Yes, but you get 400 grams for 20 rubles. Yes, but they never have the 20 ruble butter. 
There are no cartels that will dictate price. That means this is the result of demand. Please go into the children's clothing store. You wouldn't believe the prices there. Children's boots are five to eight hundred rubles. Prices are still arbitrary. Prices that had been predicted to increase threefold quadrupled in the first four months, on their way by year's end to a 2,000% rise. Yeltsin had promised concrete results by the fall, but exactly how he planned to accomplish them had never been explained to either the people or the parliament. They believe they have been elected to carry out reforms and don't doubt themselves enough. This is not a laboratory. This is a huge country. You must listen to everyone. You must always allow for the possibility that you're not right, especially if you're making decisions that will have consequences for many years in the lives of millions of people. I'm not saying everyone is one, but they have one in some ways. There are no longer shortages. People don't need to travel from Saratov to Moscow to find goods. People don't need to stand in line for three hours hoping the salesperson doesn't give them a bad piece of meat. All this is part of the past. In the new Russia, a market mentality is taking root, and the rule seems to be anything goes. That includes kids who somehow get gasoline still owned by a state monopoly to sell on the street for prices three times higher than at state-run stations. How much do you make in a day? It varies. But the minimum, if we each take home 15,000, that's a bad day. At the most, 70 to 80,000. You probably make more than your parents. My mother works in a factory as a chief bookkeeper. She gets something about 130,000 a month. My father is the head of a garage. He gets... Last time he got 91,000. Two days work here is like their monthly salary. How do you get the racketeers to leave you alone? The normal way. We give them money and that's it. You're fine. You can accept that. But they take money from everyone. Those kids are washing cars, earning money with their own labor, not speculating on anything. And they take from them too. From everyone. Everyone today is trying to earn money. Is that good or bad? On the one hand, it's good, because the Soviet Union and the communist system was a society based on dependence. Take everything away from everyone, then give everyone back a little bit. We needed to force people to worry about their own lives, even though, of course, the state shouldn't completely forget them. But the negative side is that people's understanding of good and evil has been killed. Right now on Kalinin Avenue, that's its old name, now it's called New Arbat, I have six kiosks that sell things. There are lots of people here who are prepared to pay bribes, but not everyone knows who to give them to and whether they'll be accepted. It took me two years to find the right people. I spent money, I entertained them, invited them to restaurants, gave them presents, did things that were unpleasant, demeaned myself in front of people who weren't worth it. Westerners see the kiosks as a kind of Russian mom-and-pop store. But the owners, like the owners of most new businesses here, are forced to operate on the fringes of crime. Gangs of racketeers that have sprung up in the new Russia influence virtually every transaction. Whether it's a kiosk or a hard currency bar, from 20 to 60% of the profit is paid in protection money. 
Есть две мафии, наверное, в Америке. Полиция, you probably have two mafias in America, the police and the mafia, and you decide which one you want to work with. Эдик Фавински met the backers for his bar when he worked Moscow's streets as a money trader. What's the difference between paying taxes to the government or to the mafia? Either way, you pay. Our Democrats, the powers that be are to blame, because they can't guarantee protection. If they could, I'd certainly turn to them. I'm the type of person who always tried to live honestly. But I wasn't able to. I have a family to support. It's a serious and good mafia that functions at least as well as the government. It's more stable. If you sign a one-year agreement with a mafia, you can count on it 100%. But if you make a deal with the government, there's no guarantee they won't change their minds in a month and do something different. You have to work with a good mafia. There are good people in the mafia, good economists, who want to do things according to their own rules. You must work with them. You can't think about political problems all the time. It is the Russian countryside, where for decades nothing has changed. The new Russia will come here too, bringing with it uncertainty and unanswered questions about Moscow's reforms. Production has been cut. The factories are shutting down by almost 50%. You, you see these healthy young people? They need to work at a collective farm, on tractors, and they're out there trading. They're selling bottles of vodka and cigarettes. The guy's got big muscles like this, and he's selling cigarettes. And that's what's become of Russia. Well, first I'd hang Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, next him I'd hang Yeltsin. Every one of Russia's more than 20,000 state farms had been given control over its own resources. Most are going broke. The most visible signs of change are the new country houses being built for the new rich from the cities. There is no legal right to buy and sell land, but plots of state-owned property are parceled out at a rapid rate. Very rarely, it seems, to villagers. The state farm will fall apart in two or three years. The land is all being sold. The state farm cows are being slaughtered and sold. So the state farm is gradually falling apart. What will come next? Who knows? There is a presidential decree that gives every state farm worker the right to a share of land and equipment. But it would take eight court trials for Vitya and Nina Afanasyev to get even a part of what this law said was theirs. Who did I struggle with? The state farm. The farm director didn't want to give land to the people who were leaving. I did manage to get the land out of him. But it will be very difficult to get my share of the materials. They don't want competition, so they're not giving us anything. That's the entire monopoly. No one thinks about the people. We'll be fighting each other all our lives. Everything is coming to ruin, slowly but surely. Our farm has only 40 tractors, but we have 500 workers. When they work collectively, they manage. But if 200 of them set up their own farms, then you need 200 tractors. Where are we supposed to get the other 160? Yeltsin's decree is just rhetoric, unworkable. That's what I think of his decree. They could take it away. Maybe. Anything is possible. But if you don't take risks, you don't get to drink champagne. 
Надо к чему-то стремиться. You have to strive for something. When the economic links and markets that comprised the Soviet Union's one big factory were broken, production went into freefall. Factories had no cash to buy raw materials or supplies. Millions of industrial workers were threatened with the loss of their jobs. Yeltsin orders wage hikes for workers and subsidies to prop up money-losing enterprises. Payments that are financed by printing more rubles and fueling inflation. In the sprawling military-industrial complex, state orders simply stop. Companies are told to convert to consumer production. Some can more easily than others, but the good are being brought down with the bad. The successful Soviet space shuttle was to have been a technological centerpiece in the 1990s. Its production is halted. Вы представьте себе, вот, скажем, у вас space shuttle стоит вот последний. Just imagine, your last space shuttle Endeavour cost one billion eight hundred million dollars. Он стоил у вас где-то один миллиард восемьсот миллионов долларов. If I work on it for two years and you tell me today that you're not going to buy it, you should at least pay me two-thirds of the cost. It's a lot of money. At this moment, not one kopeck has been refunded to anyone. All this money is frozen in the shape of half-made products or spare parts stored somewhere in warehouses. And this is our working capital. So you're absolutely penniless. Forget capital investments. You just have no idea how to save your skin. We are losing the highest of the high-tech industries, the ones that demand the top skills. It's becoming common for an engineer to be forced to become a street vendor. This is very dangerous, because the people at these factories are qualified and educated people who should be for democracy and for the market. And they very often turn out to be the ones who have suffered the most. This is very dangerous. What's happening now in Russia is like what you had in the 1920s. The Great Depression. He's right. Do you know how much we earn according to world standards? $200 a month, max. That's what I make. What is $200? You can't live a week on that in your country. And I make $60. I can't feed my family. I'm forced to stand here behind a counter. I never would have done this. He's a specialist and he's a specialist too. Necessity forces us to stand here behind a counter. I think many people in Russia nowadays feel this kind of pain. By the end of our lives, the whole meaning of our lives, I'm talking about people of my generation, turned out to be lost. Nobody needs us anymore. Across the Moscow River from the Ministry of Defense, one of the Soviet space shuttles now sits, waiting to be converted into a restaurant that will serve meals for dollars to tourists in Gorky Park. By the end of 1992, production had plunged further, faster than during America's Great Depression. Barely a third of the aid pledged by the West had arrived. I remember I interviewed an economic advisor to Gaidar. He said we are leading economic reforms and that for him the results of the reforms, their measure, are not only that the economy has been transformed, but that people are surviving. I asked him, what is survival? 
What conditions of people's lives represent survival? He told me that survival is when a person is not dying of hunger. I was amazed by this. I told him that a person is not a homeless dog, that it's not enough just to feed a person so he doesn't die from hunger. A person wants to go to the movies to buy himself a shirt. It is wrong to approach the notion of survival with such lowered standards. The Parliament had begun the year with an overwhelming consensus for change, but the policies themselves were deeply divisive, and by December, political consensus had been shattered. I think that was also a major delusion, that their sort of market economy can be born out of itself or out of nothing. You just put the seed and then you have the plant. I think the, the reason was that they were a sort of a recent convert into market ideology and philosophy, because by and large, in their academic career, they studied the centrally planned economies. All of them came from that background. And only when uh, reforms in uh, Eastern Europe began, they started to study and uh, trying to understand that experience. And uh, I think they have very fantastic, <laughs> fantastic um, uh, con concepts of the market economy. And they didn't quite understand that it took at least three centuries for that economy to evolve and that it has a very deep roots in, in social ethics, in philosophy, in psychology, and in many other th non-economic things. They wanted to do it in one, in one jump. It was this Russian parliament that had first elected Yeltsin its president. Boris Nikolaevich, you have stated more than once that you would resign if your government failed. It has failed, twice. Twice it received a vote of no confidence. You have deceived the Russian people many times, but carry out at least one of your promises. If you have a drop of honor or dignity left, resign along with your bankrupt government. He had embraced a plan, first devised in the West, that could not be politically sustained, a plan that carried within itself the seeds of its own destruction. They seemed to be thinking in abstractions, like the totalitarian epoch, when the ruler was the embodiment of the state, like during the Middle Ages, when you had princes and kings. But when you're in a democratic country, everything depends on the electorate. And these people did not understand that. I think they still don't understand their own dependence on the voters, that their fate depends on what kind of life is going to be lived in the country they themselves are constructing. Industrial and agricultural lobbies, more than the people's pain, would coalesce into a powerful opposition, and the government would begin to lurch from crisis to crisis. The political fight is a reflection of the extraordinary difficulties Russia faces. It is also the lingering legacy of the brief attempt to impose shock therapy. To speak as broadly as possible, all our mistakes were connected with the inadequate development of reform, with our inability to make more consistent decisions, whenever we made unnecessary compromises, we had to pay dearly. Yeltsin would spend most of this December Congress in back rooms bargaining for votes. In the end, he would vow to press ahead with reform, but sacrifice Yegor Gaidar. In just one year, Russia had been unmistakably changed. But for many, it had become a place of wild capitalism, an economy that produced crime and uncertainty. 
an increasing split between haves and have-nots, and more people dying than being born. I had very noble ideas about saving people, healing them. And I thought I'd get enough preparation to be able to get into a medical institute. But when I finished school, I understood that this wouldn't give me anything in our country at that time. When we got married, it was 1990. Until then, you could have children and hope that nothing would change. But in our country right now, there's a lot that's changed morally for the worse. Сейчас в нашей стране очень, так сказать, много изменилось в моральном плане, в худшую сторону. Поэтому очень страшно за будущее. It's terrifying to think about the future with a child. Так бы не отдал бы. Потому что, насколько я заметила, в России in Russia everything becomes distorted. Everything happens in a way other than it's supposed to. Есть у него какой-то Everything turns out horribly. It's some kind of nightmare. Crime has flourished, immorality, speculation, everything you can think of. But who is doing these things? Isn't it us? Or was it some aliens who flew here from the moon to kill, rape, cheat and lie? Who's doing it? It's us. The struggle for Russia will continue after a short break. And now, the conclusion to the struggle for Russia. January 1993. There's a new joke in Moscow. What has one year of capitalism in Russia achieved that 70 years of communists couldn't? It's made communism look good. In the last year, inflation has taken hundreds of billions of rubles out of the pockets of ordinary Russians. The new year will see the fastest and biggest sell-off of state property in history. It is a sale that is underwritten, in part, by the West a sale that is sold to the Russian population in American-produced commercials. Privatizatia. Privatization is a foreign idea with a foreign name. And for factory workers like these three couples and their children who share a cramped communal apartment, it is about as understandable as American baseball. We don't know exactly what our rights or our responsibilities are, and there's no way we can find out about these things. We ask each other, we talk about it together. Some people know more, some less. We had no understanding about reforms. Reform, 
вот что нам плохо, что нам боком обходится, то What это наше... Really конечно, is... не хватает знаний, 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 знаний не хватает. Не хватает вот, может, вот этого всего бы и не было бы. Мы же этому не учили. Да, мы уже сами своим умом no, не нашли. Мы учили нас 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 бит бит бит. Нет гарантий. Next door to the workers' dormitory is wallpaper factory number one. Like nearly 10,000 other state-owned companies, it has been declared by the government to be a stockholding corporation, the first step in privatization. In theory, workers as well as managers of these new joint stock companies were given shares. The factory here has been profitable, a monopoly producing something consumers want. It manufactures wallpaper designed by hand, a craft that has been passed through the generations since the time of the czars. Now it is to be reorganized according to economic principles that come not from Russian tradition, but from the West. They're dismantling our machines and selling them off anywhere they can. Who knows what's happening? No one asks us. The director doesn't tell us anything. I don't know if the factory's been privatized or not. Let them privatize it. But who'll do it? It'll just be the same management. Not us, not the workers. We don't know anything at all. It seems to me that we are privatized. We're not privatized. We're workers, you know. Are we privatized? You need to ask. I don't know myself. If we'd been privatized, we would have bought the factory outright, Nadja. But we didn't buy it. The directors of the state enterprises are in the most privileged position. They're told by the state, do what you want to do. The state will no longer control you. Privatize as quickly as you can. We don't care how you do it or what will happen to your company. And everywhere, the directors today are opportunists. The state has basically thrown its property to fate. We worked just like we worked before, but we were told that we were a joint stock company. Some bought shares, some received shares, but they haven't given us the shares yet. We haven't seen them with our own eyes. We don't even know what they look like. That's why things happened as they have. How can the director buy the factory? With what? It means he robbed someone. Many factory directors make their money by looting the state enterprise of raw materials and machinery, reselling at market prices, and pocketing the difference. Privatizatsia is a new Russian word. Prikvatizat, to grab, is an old one. Grabitization is privatization in the interest of the nomenclatura and the bureaucracy. That's what grabitization is. It's when, under the guise of forming a joint stock company, state property is pilfered for the benefit and use of management. And it exists. All this was filled with goods. Now there's nothing. Are there enterprises that do that, that try to sell assets and then divert resources away from the enterprise to the manager's personal interest and so on? I think that some of that unquestionably happens. I think that there are a couple of things to realize about that. Number one is they don't sell these resources nowhere. They usually sell them to uh, private entrepreneurs who might in fact have a reasonably good use of these resources so from the point of view of the welfare of the country might not be such a terrible thing. The theory is that if state property goes to those whose goal is profit, they will rehabilitate Russia's industrial carcass. In practice, it often means, as at the wallpaper factory, that the director buys new equipment for a new company using profits that the shareholders in the old company think are theirs. By the time Boris Yeltsin appeared here for an American-style photo op, 
workers had begun to realize that their company was being used as a cash cow for the director's other ventures. Within weeks, they would rebel, and in a desperate attempt to keep their jobs, lock the director out. They now work by day and guard the factory at night. If only our government would help us. I ask our government to intercede on our behalf. Yeltsin, anyone. God grant that someone hear me and help our factory so we don't have to put up with these general directors anymore. We'll do it until we win. We should win. God will help us. He exists. Official statistics claim that more than half of Russia's workforce now toils in the newly emerging private sector. But those numbers do not reveal the reality of what is happening in many different companies. Today, engineers from a joint stock company turn to us for help. They are from the Central Institute of Standard Planning. It makes the standard plans for buildings and enterprises. The case is very simple, even primitive. Five years ago, when a new director was elected, he promised a sauna and a dacha to everyone. Now more than 400 have been fired. How can it be? A year ago, this institute became a joint stock company. The workers began to ask when they were going to see their shares. And the director kicked them out and called in guards, kids in bulletproof vests, from the Stalichny Bank. It turns out that the institute has been privatized, but not to the workers, to the Stalichny Bank and some other people. So reason was pushed past the point of patience. But if bankers are going to steal shares, maybe it's time to steal from them. Citizens, if you're getting ready to privatize your company, we advise you to prepare for this carefully. It was frightening to be there, one-on-one, -on -one, and you're in there without any witnesses, nothing. They could lock you up or something. So we wanted to get a court decision about how we could get our jobs back. Please be seated. Increasingly, disputes over privatized companies will end up in court. But in the rush to create a class of owners, the legal tools that would allow judges to protect the rights of workers have been left behind. We used to report company directors who violated the law to the ministries. But that's no longer possible because all enterprises have become independent. We can't tell the director, don't violate the law anymore. These things are in the holy scriptures. How can we tell a person every time that something's bad and he shouldn't do it? These are elementary rules of behavior. The de facto privatization enriching the nomenclatura had begun long before people's privatization could be launched. And by then, inflation had robbed most people of their savings. So the government would issue vouchers, certificates giving every Russian the means to buy a share in a state-owned company when enterprises were open to public auction. We need millions of property owners, the president would say. But the vouchers were issued with a face value of 10,000 rubles, at a time when a Russian-made television set already cost 50,000. On television, Russians watch part of an $8 million public relations campaign paid for by the U.S. government. Nothing has been lost. You may invest your voucher in any city in Russia without leaving Moscow. A bus will take you from the metro station to the Moscow auction center. Call and come. The auction center is operated by an American accounting firm on contract to the U.S. government. Part of $86 million that will be spent helping manage the mechanics of privatization. Here are comparative characteristics. When you see there are a small number of shares, then you can assume that they will split. Privatization officials measure success simply, how many companies and how fast. 
But the Russians who oversee the auction center have another point of view. Privatization is being conducted using American taxpayers' money. The process is taking away from people like myself everything I worked for all my life, everything I was proud of, like my country. They took everything away in a single moment. They question just what is being accomplished. If this is a gift from the government, then it's a small gift. If this is the way to make our economy function, it's very hard to imagine how. We, the average holders of just one voucher, run into a middleman, a person who buys up shares. Privatization is making him wealthy. As the largest state enterprises begin to be privatized, Less than 25% of the 150 million vouchers are still in the hands of individuals. Many of the rest are in investment funds. Up to a third are simply traded back and forth between speculators. What no one knows is how much all this voucher trading is really helping companies, and thus the economy, toward better times. I think when privatization is complete in Russia, property will be in the hands of the people who had it before, except it will be privatized and legalized. Everybody else will get only the crumbs left over. A person will earn something, but it will be small change. The majority of what the state has accumulated will be in the hands of the nomenklatura who came to power under communism. In the grand scheme of things, it's been a reasonably clean and equitable process. That doesn't mean it's perfect, but you know, this is Russia. Many of Russia's new rich flout the law and flaunt their wealth in the finest tradition of old Russian merchants. Just two blocks from the Kremlin, a lavishly renovated restaurant occupies the space that was, a few months before, the women's half of the central banya. Public bathhouses, banyas, are another time-honored Russian tradition, a part of its communal past, and privatizing them is specifically prohibited. It's just incredible that they've opened a hard currency restaurant there instead of a barn there. Who decides that? Not me, not him, not him. It's the city authority. Either from the city or from the district. It's a paradox. They think they're not profitable. People still want to go to Banya, so they should make it pleasant for people. Public property is not subject to privatization. This public property has been around for 400 years. A banya is a place to relax, to communicate with others, to wash oneself. It's like a second church. People in the banya change. As soon as they're undressed, they all become equal. What would we do without banyas? They've taken over this banya, that banya, even women's banyas. This one in Sunduni. I used to go there all the time after the war. Only there. But now they've taken Sunduni away from us. Because they've raised the price so high. A thousand rubles to get in. Where could we get that kind of money? Five thousand. Five thousand rubles to get in. It's just unbelievable when minimum pensions are near seven or eight thousand a month. And the ticket costs five thousand rubles. What is that? Everything has changed, drastically, radically. If before they thought about the people to some extent, now they only think about gain. 
You're asking, will these banyas last? I think they won't, because as long as this government exists, everything will be sold off in the best interest of those who sell it. For them, people do not exist. When democracy comes to an end here, then we'll get our banyas back. Well, you start on democracy, then anarchy, then Russia. Where does it stop? No, we're talking concretely about banyas. They need the situation in Russia to loot, to enrich themselves. If you want to talk about politics, then we could go on for a long time. We'll get back to the banyas. We are talking about the banyas. We are talking about the banyas. It's part of caring about people, and they won't last as long as this anti-populist government exists. I don't understand him. If people's trust is the capital needed to sustain a constituency for change, much of it is being squandered. By 1993, increasing numbers of Russians are angry about corruption, economic hardship, the loss of a way of life. Yeltsin should be impeached. Not impeached, he should be killed. And many of them will become the foot soldiers for anti-Yeltsin politicians. We have reached a dead end. So I had to exercise my right to turn to the people. For more than a year, Yeltsin had been granted the power to issue decrees with the force of law. When Parliament takes that power away in March of 1993, he declares special presidential rule. We must gather courage and make the decision today to dismiss the president from office. That's the only thing that can save us all from the people who have latched on to him. They have somewhere to go, to America or Israel. But you and I are citizens of Russia. While the question of impeachment rages inside the Kremlin, defenders of the two sides gather in Red Square, on opposite sides of Lenin's tomb. Until there's a trial for the Communist Party, all the Bolsheviks must answer for murder. They must be condemned. We have to remove Lenin, traitor of Russia's people. As long as that body is lying there, we'll have nothing good in this country. Russia is at a crossroads. One road leads to enslavement by transnational American capital. The other is the long and glorious road of a great power. We must understand we are fighting here for a great Russia, and not for that criminal clique that is selling our forests, our coal, our oil. The crowd of 30,000 who protest Yeltsin's policies is dwarfed by the 100,000 Muscovites who come to support him. The nationalists and the rest of the has-beens are of course using everything within their means to eliminate Yeltsin. This is a person who plays on conflict. His task is always to create a schism in society, to separate his supporters from his opponents. Russia by nature, or maybe by its communist experience, has a tendency towards maximalism. It's not used to an evolutionary way of development. Our entire political mentality has been trained for constant battle, an irreconcilable battle. We have to find an enemy and overcome it. Yeltsin's enemies include two men who stood with him during the August coup, Parliament Speaker Hasbulatov and Vice President Lutskoy. Together, the two will build an opposition that increasingly relies on communists and nationalists for support. 
Why are former supporters of a democratic Russia leaving you, esteemed Democrats, and joining the irreconcilable opposition? You should ask yourselves that question. It is difficult for Westerners to understand the struggle for Russia by trying to define who is for reform and who is against it. On the streets, it is an ideological battle, but in the parliament, it is a raw fight for political and economic power. There is no compromise. This is characteristic of both Yeltsin and Speaker Haspilatov. No one wants to yield. And this is absolutely fatal. We cannot have any kind of economic reforms. We can't rely on pushing society forward when you have to beat down everybody who does not agree with you. It is a kind of neo-Bolshevism. You laugh, but I am sad. Right against left, left against right, back and forth. Some things must be sacred here, though there's little left. It was not a fight between democracy and conservatism, but a fight between two central committees, and we are forced to choose between them. I don't want to choose. The idea of democracy, the idea of liberalism is important to me, the ideals, the principles, the laws, and I am forced to choose between two central committees. Increasingly, the political fight has little connection to people's lives. I am infinitely irritated by this Russian character of seeking compromise, then beating each other black and blue all over again. Everybody is fed up, fed up to the point of nausea. Take this Congress. It's simply impossible to watch it. It's like a poison in our blood. You want to go and drink a bottle of vodka just so you don't have to watch it anymore. The president barely escapes the vote to impeach, and he backs away from presidential rule. But he wins agreement to call a referendum on his policies, and that will postpone any collision for at least four more weeks. The people will be asked four questions. Support for Yeltsin, support for his economic reforms, early elections for president and for parliament. The new pro-Yeltsin rallying cry, da, da, nyet, da, is sold with the help of American PR. Less than two weeks before the vote, it is question number two that worries Yeltsin's government the most. In unpublished American polls, support for the economic reforms is losing by 15 points. A significant part of the population has lost a great deal as a result of these reforms, has become poorer. It's not whether they've become poorer in the strictly physical sense. Before, too, very many were poor. But now no one knows what the future will bring. Still, life goes on, the natural things occur, people fall in love, get married, have children, laugh, people live their lives. On April 25th, the Russian people will voice a commitment to change that is still stronger than nostalgia for the past. Yeltsin himself wins the support of almost 60% of the voters, it will be interpreted as an overwhelming victory, not only for the president, but for his policies. What no one knows is that behind the scenes, more than $1 million in private Western money has been spent in political marketing to ensure that question two passes. It does, but barely. Russians remain ambivalent. I'm anti-communist, but I'm not for democracy. This isn't democracy, it's shitocracy. May 1st, a scant six days later, the day on which communists had once celebrated their solidarity, nationalist leaders provoked their supporters into a confrontation with police.
многие рассматривают политическую борьбу как войну. К сожалению, этим закладывается и смертельной вражды. Мы закладываем, к сожалению, незамедленного действия даже не только по нынешними политиками, но и под самой демократией в России. By the summer, it is as if no government exists at all. I went today to get bread. The store had just opened. I gave them my money, but they said, old woman, we won't give you your bread. You don't have new money. So I left without any bread. When it's announced that Russians have only 48 hours to exchange old rubles for new ones, no one in the government will take credit or blame. Now I don't even have money to buy my medicine. Pensioners are caught with useless rubles. Black marketeers exchange theirs with no trouble. And no one knows if it is reform or sabotage. I would shoot them on the spot, the bastards. But we're the ones who choose them. What do you mean? I didn't choose them. They can go to hell. What Russians seem to want most is a respite from the political wars. But the power struggle will continue into the fall, becoming almost surreal. The president issues decrees as if there were no Supreme Soviet. The Supreme Soviet suspends those decrees as if there were no president. And then Yeltsin warns his rivals of a decisive battle to come in September. In accordance with the president's decree, which has already been signed, the legislative and supervisory functions of the Congress of People's Deputies and the Supreme Soviet of the Russian Federation are suspended as of today. The Congress may no longer convene. On September 21st, Boris Yeltsin calls elections for a new legislature and orders the sitting parliament dissolved. The parliament refuses to disband, names Vice President Rutskoy acting president, and holds up in the White House. For 12 days, the threats and accusations escalate. Yeltsin cuts the building's telephones and electricity. The parliament begins to arm. Riot police are ordered to keep supporters at bay. On Sunday afternoon, October 3rd, after two days of violent skirmishes, the crowd suddenly breaks through. Rutskoy does the unthinkable. He incites the throng to armed revolt. Young men, able-bodied men, we are now forming detachments. We must take the mayor's office and the television station today. For three hours, the mob marches through Moscow. Where are you going? To take the television station. No one stops them. Yeltsin returns to Moscow from his country house. In the Kremlin, there is chaos. On the streets, the real fear of civil war. He will spend the night convincing the military they must act. The president's tanks were reduced to a charred hulk, the same White House he had once stood on another tank to defend. 
I entreat military comrades, whoever hears me, come immediately to the aid of the parliament. I entreat you, save dying people, save dying democracy. The very fact that reforms were radical, very rapid, uh, that was a shock thing. I think it played a very major role in producing the basis for this sharp political conflict which led to the bloodshed and the tanks shooting on the parliament. And, uh, you know, the, this, this problem, how, how the, that type of systemic reform of totalitarian society and democratic political mechanism can be combined, whether they, are, uh, whether they can exist together at this critical stage or not. That's a very serious and very large question, looming very large in the minds of many people now in this country. And the parliament became a sort of megaphone, political megaphone for all this pain, for all this disillusion, for all this resistance, for all this hatred. By official count, 146 people have died. The word democracy already sounds so much like a swear word here because the Democrats themselves turned out to be so undemocratic, made so many mistakes, poured so much fury and hatred onto one another. To imagine that the parliament that's to be elected will be able to agree within itself, will be constructive, will resolve problems, is very difficult. President Clinton will reaffirm his support for Boris Yeltsin. The Yeltsin government, he says, is on the right side of history. You're probably aware of how Yeltsin came to power. People supported him because he promised us democracy, but he shot up that democracy. Not only did he violate it, but he shot it up. If in America, Clinton fired on the Congress, would you agree to that? No? When you have elections, do they fire on the White House? You're either ignorant people there or you don't understand what's going on here. And if you understand that he is criminal and you're praising this criminal, supporting him, what do you call this? It's low. Elementary meanness. Maybe a critical mass has been reached of humiliation, a feeling of inferiority, and that could lead to very serious consequences. It will pave the way for what has been called a politics of loss. There will be one united Russia. I'll bring order. I'll restore the borders of the Russian state within the bounds of what there was. Nothing new. We won't seize Hungary, but what we had before the October Revolution on September 1st, 1917, including Finland, we won't seize it, we will liberate it. Every day I see Zhirinovsky on the screen. He works on his audience by striking those chords which can be easily aroused. And I shall not be surprised if we have a repeat of the situation that existed in Hitler's Germany when people really vote democratically and vote for a person of that kind. The leading pro-government party, Russia's Choice, is one of 13 competing in the December elections to elect a slate of candidates. It is headed by Yegor Gaidar. I will always have this image in mind when I talk of the manageability of our reforms. I'm sitting behind the wheel of a car, but someone else is controlling the gas and brake pedals, and a third person has the ignition key. Of course, one could easily take offense at this situation, start to cry, quit and say, deal with it yourself. In an American campaign, Gaidar's opponents would ask a simple question. Are you better off now than you were two years ago? 
They say Gaidar is a radical democrat. He is for a different economy. Then they say, let's build capitalism. And they built it for themselves. In two years, they've already become capitalists. They have money. They have everything that they need. And again, they read you the ideological fairy tale. The market economy will save us from everything. They hide behind the wide back of the president. They take money out of the country and send their children off for extended study. Their wives off for extended rest. In any crisis, they leave for extended tours. They are so arrogant that the same old people are once again climbing to the top. His program speaks for itself. Substantial renewal of the way of life, improvement of the people's situation. We are living on the edge from Kopec to Kopec. What kind of life is this? What's your occupation? I am an engineer economist. If voters want to know what kind of future they are going to face, President Yeltsin will provide no answers. He stays out of the parliamentary campaign and out of sight. Defending the government's policies will fall to the candidates of Russia's choice, like Sergei Kovalyov, number two on the party slate, and Vasily Selyunin, an economist. Elections had been called quickly to give pro-government forces the advantage, but they were as unprepared as the other parties to run a blitz campaign across a country of 150 million people. You know, I am personally keeping tabs on the economy. Or maybe I will astound TV viewers, but the economy is improving, more or less. In two years of reform, yes, the standard of living has fallen. Production has decreased as well, and the total national income has also declined. But production has not decreased catastrophically. We Russians have rescued our economy. Well, let's hope that voters will appreciate this. After all, life is always more pleasant when there's hope. The train is at 8.30. We'll call Gaidar. That's the solution. Call Gaidar from here. I don't have the telephone number. Then we'll call someone in Moscow at Russia's choice and have them call Gaidar. The voters in Saratov, an industrial town on the Volga River, had given Yeltsin a solid majority in the April referendum. There are other questions. Directors of state companies, for the most part, have the opportunity to receive salaries for little effort and have their personnel take vacations at workers' expense. They ask questions they have asked since the beginning of reforms. How are they supposed to work? And who is going to gain? How will you establish the profits? Excuse me, it is not the proceeds that you tax, not the proceeds. You know, you can't establish the profits. My train is going to leave, excuse me. Your profits are what you've sold, minus what you spent. Excuse me very much, but think about it while you're riding on the train. Elementary. Sunday, December 12th, election day. 25 American observers including former Attorney General Richard Thornburg, will inspect polling places and interview voters, trying to verify that the Russian elections will be fair. There are complicated ballots in the parliamentary election, as well as a vote on a new constitution. For 10 days, there has been a ban on the publication of any opinion polls. One can only guess at what the day's results will be. Uh, difficult to say. No, no one particularly influence. Is this the first time you voted? So this is a normal ballot for you? In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And many voters today, when asked uh, who made the most uh, 
sharpest impression and they oh sure and off scene. One of the frequent expressions we've heard is we, we need order back in the country. We're looking for order and perhaps some simplicity again. Oh, it's a fascinating country. Absolutely fascinating. And uh, it's a country I've always wanted to visit and a very complex one. 11 p.m. Sunday night. At the headquarters of Russia's choice, results of the voting have begun to be tabulated. Zhiranovsky is in second, with 17 percent. Yovlinsky is in third, 15 percent. So will the Democrats have a majority of the seats in the parliament? They'll have a majority, but not a big one. By 2 a.m., Zhiranovsky's party takes the lead in the popular vote and the parliamentary majority the candidates here expect vanishes. Zhirinovsky? Of course I'm concerned about it. Such Democrats we are. You can look at it as an amusing game, a political circus, but in fact, this is what could shape mankind in the 21st century. I think the elections will serve as a useful lesson for both Boris Yeltsin and for all of us. What about the West? What, what should they be thinking? What would you say to them? From the West? Yeah. Watch and tremble. <laughs> The president wins the vote for a new constitution, but he seems to have lost touch with the people with whom he once had an almost intuitive connection. It seems to me that today, when Yeltsin walks up to the mirror, he doesn't see himself. He sees Gorbachev there. Because today he is repeating Gorbachev completely. They are mirror images of each other. I hope to God I am wrong, but I think that the end of Yeltsin will be, at best, like that of Gorbachev. The social explosion that had so long been feared had come democratically at the polls. Only yesterday, it seems, the future was full of hope. Now Russia faces another time of troubles, her people deeply wounded, divided, afraid. Who's guilty? That's an eternal Russian question. Everyone. The struggle for Russia still lies ahead. years ago, a Russian poet wrote, Not by reason is Russia conceived, nor gauged by common measure. She has a special grandeur. In Russia you can only believe.
Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. <laughs>